and welcome to Across Africa. I'm Georgia Calvin-Smith with our weekly look at stories from across the continent. This week in Libya, a crackdown on trafficking gangs operating out of the city of Sobrata has started to bear fruit. Italian authorities say that they've noticed a marked drop in the number of arrivals dangerously smuggled in from the other side of the Mediterranean. Also, a property boom in Cape Town has seen once neglected neighborhoods transformed into trendy enclaves. But as prices go up, long-term renters are being pushed out. And in Ivory Coast, the start of the academic year is around the corner, but thousands of students are forced to sleep in corridors, toilets and lecture halls, years after halls of residence meant to house them were shut by the government. We take a closer look. But first, in Libya, a crackdown on trafficking gangs operating out of the city of Sobrata have started to bear fruit. Italian authorities say that they've noticed a marked drop in the number of arrivals from the other side of the Mediterranean. The change has been put down to a combination of more coastal surveillance and the upping of pressure on Libyan smugglers. Take a look. The Libyan city of Sabrata has become one of the main departure points for migrants trying to reach Europe. Their people smugglers send dozens of boats across the Mediterranean daily with almost total impunity. But over the past few months, local authorities have begun to fight back. We told them, either deal with or get rid of those migrants, or we will use force against you. It was a powerful message and was well understood by the smugglers. Thanks to the support of local militias, themselves backed and armed by Libya's national unity government, the ultimatum has had the desired effect. According to Basim Rabli, the commander of a unit fighting clandestine migration, nine out of ten traffickers have agreed to cease their illegal activities. 10,000 people were destined to be smuggled to Italian and southern European shores, but in an agreement between security forces, local residents and human traffickers, the smugglers surrendered the migrants. The launch last month of joint surveillance operations by the Italian and Libyan coast guards has also ramped up pressure on traffickers. And across the Mediterranean, the results have begun to show. Only 3,200 migrants arrived in Italy in August, 87% less than at the same time last year. Over 150 women are thought to be assaulted in South Africa every day. The rate of sexual violence in the country is amongst the highest in the world. Many victims say that they feel let down by the police who are responsible for helping track down their attackers. The country's police force is accused of being insensitive and slow in their investigations, and conviction rates currently stand at under 10%. This South African woman was raped by a minibus driver on her way to work. She managed to flag down passers-by and the perpetrator was caught. But her attacker was never convicted, even though her blood was smeared on his vehicle. Most of the time, radio and television campaigns encourage us to come forward to report rape. But when we come forward, they make us feel guilty for the rape. Sometimes people are discouraged from reporting rape because the police assume the rapist is your boyfriend. Many South African rape victims feel let down by the police. 150 rape cases are reported every single day, but less than 10% of cases that go to trial end in a guilty verdict. There's a strong sense of hopelessness. There's this deep frustration, but even hopelessness that is experienced by the victims and their families, because it's almost as if they feel they're fighting the system. They're not only fighting the perpetrator. Feeling there's nowhere to turn, women are increasingly taking matters into their own hands. Self-defense classes for women are on the rise across the country. As for the police, they recognize that things need to change. We need to give confidence. We need to respond to the outcries of millions of our people that uh, our police force does not respond adequately to this matter. In recent years, the South African government has opened 57 specialized sexual offenses courts.
But perhaps the greatest sign of progress was at a recent rally for women's rights where men were as numerous as women. People who've lived their whole lives in parts of Cape Town are at risk of being kicked out of their neighbourhoods or even the city as property prices rocket in Western Cape Province. The suburb of Woodstock is one of the areas where long-time rental residents are being left behind by rising prices. South Africa's slowing economy and political uncertainty have hit the property market countrywide. But Cape Town is an expensive exception. People want to be in Cape Town. They want the lifestyle. Population is growing, demand is increasing, and the supply of the amount of houses that should be developed on a yearly basis is not keeping up to that. Charmaine Marcus has been living in the suburb of Woodstock for 35 years. As local landlords sold off their properties to developers, she's watched it become a trendy neighborhood of choice for young professionals. Then she woke up to an eviction letter. I was just like, what's happening? This now, after all these years, I feel actually, it's actually so heartbroken because it seems to me they just don't want us here. The city is offering evictees emergency housing at a site some 30 kilometers away. But activists occupying an abandoned Woodstock hospital say buildings like this should be used to provide affordable accommodation closer to the city center. This is such unused resources. I can't understand how the city would just leave something like this. This city doesn't work for you. It works against you. The people getting moved out of town are 40, 50, 60 kilometers out of town where they've got no voice. There's no transport system. There, there's no health care. The city says the distant emergency housing is all they have to offer, but they're trying to change that. What we're working on now is to identify sites spread across the city so that if there is a displacement or there is an eviction or there is an emergency, that people are not required to move so far. Until those developments become a reality, these residents say they will keep fighting their removal from the city they call home. The start of the academic year in Ivory Coast is just around the corner. Thousands of students in Abidjan, though, will once again be forced to sleep in corridors and lecture theatres, as many of the halls of residence they're meant to call home have long been shut. Our correspondents report. These abandoned buildings, walls blackened by time, once housed several thousand students. This hall of residence is one of 10 campus buildings across Abidjan that's been abandoned since the end of the post-electoral crisis of 2011. After being occupied by armed groups and criminals, the buildings were meant to be renovated six years ago. Tired of waiting, a few members of the student union have taken matters into their own hands and begun the renovations themselves. This room has been used as a toilet. You can see that people have urinated here. Renovating these halls help reduce the various social problems that students face. It's important to be in a peaceful setting where you sleep quietly to be able to achieve your goals. Out of 15 halls of residence across Abidjan, only five are functional. At the end of each day, the routine is the same. Hundreds of students come to spend the night in the classrooms they attended during the day. Students like Jeanette, who live like refugees in the university, have been nicknamed Kosovars. For lack of facilities, the male and female student body use the same toilet. It's not easy for a girl to wash here. Sometimes the toilets are clogged, so we have to go outside. It's difficult to go to the toilet outside. A few metres away, this toilet's been turned into a bedroom. Kouadio, a medical student, has lived here for five years. The country's future high flyers forced to live in substandard housing as the commute is too far and transport costs too expensive to live at home during their studies. It hurts to sleep in a toilet while you have a room at home, but if you want to succeed tomorrow, you have to go through this first. According to the main student union, the government's promise to build new halls of residence and to complete the refurbishment of the existing ones by the end of 2019. A group of young people in the northern Nigerian city of Yola have taken their futures into their own hands by starting a shoemaking business. The young entrepreneurs say that they were inspired to cobble together their own plan of action after job opportunities dwindled because of the Boko Haram insurgency. 
Two years ago, YOLO was still the target of Boko Haram attacks. Shoemaker Joshua Samuel had to close his shop. But the jihadist group has now been pushed back and the town's economy is looking up. Samuel says he makes up to $200 a week. Business is speaking because as when I come here during insurgency, people have no work doing. And when they, when they start coming, they are patronizing us. Samuel also trains unemployed youths as shoe cobblers in a country where official figures say half the 15 to 24 year olds are out of work. The economy will not build itself. It's actually we that will build the economy. Even if insurgents have affected and destroyed the economy, we will still be the ones to build it. Shoes in this shop cost between four and eight dollars. Residents say they prefer to buy locally made shoes. We have tried some of the shoes at the, at the, at the showroom and compare the price, that one is higher and it can't last long like the one that he usually made with his hand. So I believe on local products, they last longer. So far Samuel has trained 20 young men. He and his apprentices hope one day to sell their shoes not just in Yola but across Nigeria. Well, that's it for Across Africa for now. But remember, you can always catch up with daily news from across the continent with me with Eye on Africa, Monday to Friday. But that's it for the moment. Thanks for joining us. Take care.